My name is David Whitehead, and I'm here as well with Chris Rusak. We are Modern Knowledge. Our website is modernknowledge.ca, and we are bringing some groundbreaking knowledge to you today, speaking with the lovely Dr. Carmen Bolter once again, following up with her on the interview that uh, I was able to do at our Vancouver stop of our recent event, Disclosure Canada. And Carmen, um, you've got some incredible things happening behind the scenes. This is something that is happening right now, and you've made some huge discoveries and some huge uh, insights about what's going on in Egypt. And uh, let's maybe kind of refresh for people that are watching this interview for the first time. What's happening? How did this discovery come about? What is the discovery? And then let's dissect it bit by bit. The Hawara Labyrinth has been known over time, all the way back to Herodotus in 450 BC. And he talked about this complex that had 1,500 rooms on two different levels, a total of 3,000 rooms. And then over the centuries, Pliny and Strombo and all these different people have talked about it. And uh, Sir Flinders Petrie in 1881 went and did a full dig and found a whole Roman level and then a Ptolemaic level, which is Anthony and Cleopatra's time. And then there's two more levels below it. So in archaeology, older is deeper. Now there's been teams, a Polish team, a Belgian team, that were doing work up until 2008. And they went to the site and did ground penetrating radar by laying the wires right on the sand. But no one had done space archaeology on it. And so um, this is a completely new technology, a completely new way of being able to look through layers and go all the way down, six kilometers down. And so Klaus Donna and his company out of uh, Germany and Vienna um, have developed this software application that goes on the live satellite feed. And it's working with quantum physics and standing columnar waves, so longitudinal waves and Maxwell equations. And that's all to say that it's similar to barcodes. So what you see how the information on a barcode at the grocery store um, will give all the information about the product. Um, it's similar. To, in the layman's terms, that's the simplest metaphor to go for in terms of how this works. Now, most ground penetrating radar, there's lots of different applications out there, but nothing is like this one. Because what this one can do is it looks through the layer. So the other ones, if you hit something, that's it. If there's something underneath, no can do. They can't see it. And so, but the other thing is that each element, each anomaly has its own pattern, logarithmic pattern. And so they do a scan for pottery. Uh, they can tell the difference between pottery, water, precious metals, precious jewels, bone. Okay. And so each of these have their own characteristic signature. So the way that this technology has been used is governments will call up and say, well, you know, we need water. They did, they did one for California, and they found two underground rivers at 160 meters and 170 meters, something like that. But they found water in Zimbabwe. They found diamonds in Brunei, gold in Bolivia. But mostly when they find stuff, it's just like five deposits. You know, they can do oil and gas, but they don't want to because of the environment, and they, they, they'd rather turn their attention to things that are more useful pardon me, for humanity. So this technology is, is phenomenal. And uh, Klaus Donna's friend has developed this particular one. So there's other space archaeology that's being done, but not like this. So and when was this particular, I guess, discovery? I mean, it's been discovered in the past, as you said, but not to this level. When was this recent scan completed? Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> So I found the coordinates. See, that's the other thing is that the team from before had the driving directions, but they didn't have the coordinates. And so I have been looking for this place for 25 years. And so I started thinking that these chambers would have been under the Giza Plateau. And I spent five years going down under the hole. And then there was this picture, an image that had been sent to me. It's actually on my website of this trapezoid shape with a, a, a circle in the middle X marks the spot and something that looked like a pyramid. And so in February 2012, I led an expedition into the open desert, again, looking for this place. Like I've got the sense, you know, and the, the past life memory that there's something that has this huge space that's very, very deep and very, very old. And so we went in with a Russian scientist, Dr. Konstantin Korakov, 
a crew from New York, a film crew, and a hot air balloon, mm. and found the place. And we had to fly in there. It was a military zone wow. with unexploded landmines. Couldn't have been more dangerous. I mean, this was a real adventure. And then we got there, landed badly because it was late, bumped around on the desert, and then went walking to this place and went, oh, it's falling apart. It's modern. And what it, they had literally built a concrete pyramid, and the Air Force was using it as a target for their pilots that were practicing. So we measured the energy fields on the Earth, and they were all wiggly still, even though it's you know could have been many years since they'd used it. And so that was just to say that was a dud, and that was three years ago. So, okay, that's not it. Giza's not it. Uh, I wonder where this place is. And so somebody sent me a link, um, and I had seen it before. Um, the, the, this, this thing is, is the, um, the image that uh, is known for the labyrinth, and if you look at the center of it, um, and it's, the, the legend is it's all at once a labyrinth, a brain, and a pyramid. And so it's my conviction that these are multidimensional uh, ideas, signatures, symbols uh, about biology and cosmology and astronomy and, and archetypes along the edges here. And it's, you know, it hasn't been deciphered. And this was a copper engraving that was done in 1670. So since 2008, when the ground penetrating radar was done, and I do have an image of that scan as well, that, that was really low resolution. And it just looks like blobs, hmm. you know, colored blobs. But they made a big announcement and said that they had discovered it. But we have to understand that there's methodology involved. And if you have a scan, high definition or low definition, it's the hypothesis. Right, and yeah. we need to go to the field and get the verification. So it was premature for them to say that they had discovered it. But pretty much now when you, you know, investigate, everybody knows there's something down there. Except Zahi Hwas. He says there's nothing there. <laughs> well, we're going to prove him wrong. And then you come in with, and you've got this advanced form of a scan. And if I'm correct, you're working on this with Klaus. And he was basically the connection to getting the ability to do this scan, right? That's right. But the thing is, is that because we've been talking for a couple of years, um, the other contracts that he's gotten that use this scan, they actually go to the country and dig and say, here it is. And so for things like finding water, they can see the flow rate of the water, the amount of water. And that's why this is really important for places like California. And so there's validity and reliability in the scan. And so in quantitative research methods, which I taught at the graduate level at University of Calgary for years, um, that's what you, those are the two buzzwords. And so um, validity means you're actually measuring what you think you're measuring. So in psychological tests, you know, not very likely, likely, those, those uh, Likert scores, I mean, they force everybody to say three because they don't know what the question means. So those don't have a lot of validity because you're not measuring what you think you're measuring. And then reliability is if you do this test over and over and over again in different places, you'll come up with similar results. And so this test is turning out to be, this, not this test, this scanning technology, they're calling it spooky accurate. Okay. Now, we don't know if the government's going to give us permits and let us go excavate. And at the, the great depth that it is, we don't know if we can even go get it out. Right. So there, it may be that we're left with the virtual reality and that we don't verify it. You know, like that's that's iffy, like just because this is a major discovery that could help people give hope, change, you know, be a game changer for how we see ourselves because of the extreme antiquity of it. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to get the chance to do it. And so that's why I think it's important to really, you know, start thinking about what it is. Before we get into the details of the discovery, Carmen, I just wanted to orient the viewers as to the approximate location um, that you're speaking about and that you're going to be showing us about. Um, you mentioned before it's it's south of Cairo, so if everybody's familiar with uh, the Nile Delta leading out to uh, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Cairo is at the base of that delta. Um, and where is this location relative to the Giza Plateau in Cairo itself? It's 95 kilometers south, and it's beside the Fayum Oasis. And the, which is the, right here. I'm showing you on the map right here. 
So is that is that an artificial lake to the to the northwest, I guess, of that oasis, or is that? It's it, not artificial, and that's actually a good question because there are ancient maps that show a displacement of water, and it's called Lake Morris, M O E R I S, and it's about a forty-five minute drive from this pyramid, and we went there, and it's this enormous salt lake in the middle of Egypt. Oh wow! Yeah. And so that is just mind-boggling in itself, but apparently this is so old that the legends are talking about two pyramids in, in the lake, but on a little island, and some people think that the water went all the way to Giza. Well, whoa, 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 what about the Nile? And if the Nile was covered, I mean, if you think about the pyramid code and time and the geological movement of the river and all that stuff how old are we talking about here yeah so there's a lot of speculation and uh, a lot of unknowns that go with it but i think that we are speaking because of the depth and it's 30 kilometers from the nile which is you know the sphinx is eight miles from the nile and so you know and we we've, we've, we've already examined the extreme antiquity of that you know, through the pyramid code. So we are talking old here. It's almost like um, it's almost like that lake there has been um, has basically been cut off from an an, an ancient uh, water system that was once connected to a, a greater ocean. Let's say um, it's like a landlocked a landlocked salty sea of of one sort or another. Right, and so research into geology, the geology of the area you know, is, is, is all important in terms of, you know, coming up with some final conclusions about this. Okay, wonderful. So what at this point is happening right now, just sort of a quick little synopsis. Um, right now, you're in the talks with trying to see if they would allow some kind of excavation or further research, or is there going to be more scans, you know, trying to be done to get more accurate uh, data on this? Or where does this stand now? Well, the final report, you know, will have the details, but there's a, an instrument that they bring with them that is more accurate than the other things. And so we are proposing to do boreholes into the key rooms that have, I'm putting it out there, there's six rooms that apparently have gold. And so we can say X marks the spot and drill the borehole and send a 3D mapping camera in to show the whole thing and I suppose we could do virtual reality with that whether or not the excavation happens um, and that's just amazing that you can actually do that nowadays and that's that's a very uh, unobtrusive way to actually explore an ancient site without doing too much damage the small, yeah. small well, core hole and then using that camera there to see what's there instead of ripping the whole thing out of the ground well, and these cameras exist, and again, this is the new technology is what's helping us do all this. Um, but it's not an excavation if you don't excavate, if you don't go. And so archaeology is a destructive science. Mm -hmm. And so the only entity that gives permits to excavate is the Supreme Council of Antiquities. And they meet every eight weeks, and there's a committee, and there's protocol. And they need a principal archaeologist and a secondary archaeologist that are linked to major universities. And so we would be principal investigators. And you have to have qualifications to apply. So, you know, you can't just call up a university secretary's office and say, hey, I want to do a PhD, okay? Yeah. And like, well, I don't have a master's or a bachelor's, but no problem, right? That's not how it works. You know, applications are very, very long, drawn out processes where you fill in all the different categories and then you make the proposal so you know we're proposing cultural heritage and visitor center and marketing and all that kind of stuff but also all the virtual reality apps and all of that and the and the documentary being made as we go along all of that is 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 on the table and so uh the the, the step though is even though we've got this scan it could be just like google earth five meters off mm -hmm. or something and so there's a, a device with an antenna, and you walk on the ground, you connect with the scan from before, and you say, here. But the trick is the depth, because none of the other stuff that they did before actually um, is showing that. And so they, their scans even say somewhere between 5 and 12 meters. Yeah. And so this was the most sophisticated technology they had then. Eight years ago was a long time in terms of technology. Yeah. So newer is better, 
and older is deeper. Those are our little buzz phrases. <laughs> well, do you want to take people on a little journey? I know you have a bit of a 3D, you got the 3D mapping there. We can show them just so they can get a visual concept of how big this is. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking for the blue scan right here. No, nope, that's the blue red. Well, there, there you go. Um, there's the, the elevations, and somebody must have known that the, that the um, rooms follow parallel to an existing um, canal that's there. And uh, these chambers are really big. So um, I guess I can just show you this little animation here that's showing that the levels don't connect. So it's completely separate. Two levels with no snakes and ladders connections between them. So what a lot of people, um, you know, think is it's going to be like a tomb where you go up and down in between the two levels. And so in my mind, this suggests that it's d different constructions. Mm, yeah. and, and this is an over, this is a reoccurring theme in Egypt is um, different stages of the civilization building on top of more ancient structures in order to provide a, uh, a place marker or to uh, or to um, just to guide people to the sacredness of that site do you think that this is something that's happening with this site here in Hawar? well I don't think it's a temple um, my dog is barking that's okay should I, should I go save her she's a welcome guest on the show you know that Carmen right you have to she's gonna keep barking unless that's I go okay. get her <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, David. They always um, they would always build a a newer structure over top of an older structure. Um, yeah, it's it's as if maybe that spot for whatever reason was known to have something already there, and maybe yeah. throughout time there was the the older original dig yes. with the setup. And we'll get into Carmen. Me, oh, hello. <laughs> She's got the best sunglasses in the business, man. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Hmm. No, Chris and I were just talking, you know, thinking about the way that looks is you, you seem to have sort of like the first dig, the first construction. Uh, you seem to think that this is more of a practical application, uh, possibly from some pre-Diluvian culture going underground, possibly storing uh, some of their technology, some of their gold, some of their uh, whatever artifacts. And then maybe later on, because it was known that that area was used for this, later on there was more... Uh, added later on maybe it could be something totally different maybe it could be linked i mean we don't know but what do you think originally this was used for you know it's it's almost not fair to speculate and yeah. i know that all along i've been you know having an issue with sitchin that you know people you know four hundred fifty thousand years ago we were enslaved which to me speaks to the idea that we're not enslaved now but i don't think that's true uh you know, they came down from another planet. I mean, really, uh, you know, we we really have to piece this together. And people like Klaus Donna and Michael Cremo, who I'm going to be speaking with at the Modern Knowledge Tour, um, have given us a big gift by helping us go farther back to begin to speculate. And so in some ways, you know, this is incredibly threatening to to consider that we may have some kind of record of the really, really old stuff. And I really don't think that it was on the surface at some point and then it got buried. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that it was designed to be underground. But if you look at the construction, it's it's not the same old, same old. It's not a temple with connecting rooms. Like all the temples, you, there's an entrance, there's a hypostyle hall, you go through. It's replicating the cavities of the body, and you go all the way through to the pineal gland and the Holy of Holies. And in the cosmology and the tradition ideology in Egypt, it was only the highest level initiates that would go further along. And the first the first level was for, you know, the populace, I suppose. But, you know, it's not the same thing as that. And also, the three areas of the construction are different from one another. Yeah. Now, would you, just to explore this a little bit further, Carmen, so there's the, the, the red level, which is the deepest, the mm -hmm. blue level, which is uh, on top of the red level, but below the actual ground level, as we oh, see yeah. it today. And Very then on, to on top of that, there is an actual pyramidal structure. And I guess that would be Old Kingdom, New Kingdom... Uh, Egypt, uh, is there a date for that pyramid? Okay. That's, that's yes, on top? The, okay, so um, 
red level, blue level, Ptolemaic level, Alexander the Great, Anthony, Cleopatra, Roman level, then the pyramid. Now, there could be a straight-sided pyramid underneath. The pyramid is mud brick. Okay. And, um, yeah, and so it, th that means it's much, much later because we know that um, the better constructions are older mm -hmm. and the more modern constructions fall apart. They yeah. actually call it the weeping pyramid, and it, they literally made bricks out of mud, and any kind of moisture kind of melts it away, and so it almost looks like tears going down the face, and it's actually rounded, and it is for it used to be 50 meters high, and now it's 46, so it's eroded. But there's also water inside. I just was at the site six weeks ago, and so we, I've got footage, and you throw a stone in, and it goes plunk into the water. So a lot of the concern for, for the excavation would be that the water had seeped into the passageways and that was going to complicate the excavation. But we did the full scan for water and apparently the water's underneath the lowest level. And so, what's, what's the yeah. institutionalized uh, view of the Hawar area? Like, w what, is, what is the standard, uh, the standard uh, saying right now that people... Is there any special significance given to this area in textbook Egyptology? that you're aware of? Well, Flinders Petrie did a dig in 1881 and uncovered the Ptolemaic stuff and the Roman stuff. Now, the wooden sarcophagi that the, the, the Roman level had has the oldest painted lifelike faces anywhere in the world, apparently. And so they literally would take the face of the person who had passed away and paint it on the, the foot of their wooden box that they put them in. There's a, a city called Crocodopolis or something like that, and they, they, they were doing a lot. Uh, so they found mummified crocodiles. They found quite a few mummified bodies there. Um, and there is an outdoor museum, an open-air museum of things that they have found. But that's all from the two surface areas. It could be there's another pyramid underneath. We, we don't know. Wow. So is there any... I guess agencies trying to block this investigation, Carmen. Do you feel like there's like, even on the? I mean, I know it's difficult in general to get the what you need in order for excavation and and all that, and to get on the ground. But have you felt that there's been anything that is purposely trying to block this discovery from coming out? Yes, there's been a lot of interference patterns, and the, also in Egypt. I mean, basically. I called him Dr. No. Zahi says, yes, 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 give me all your stuff, and then no, you can't do your, your work. So in the 30 years that I've been running around Egypt, uh, very little major work has been excavated. Uh, they, they just don't seem to be able to get around to doing it. And there's a 12-page guidelines for the application to the SCA, and the first point is no new application, no new permits to excavate will be granted in Upper Egypt and in brackets Giza to Abu Simbel. Well, that's the whole thing. But apparently this site is exempt and that, that they, there really are a lot of people that are looking to do that. But they got the new Zahi, um, Dr. Rada, is very, very interested in preservation of the mud brick pyramid because he did his PhD research in mud brick pyramids and this thing is falling apart. So you can see right through some places where the mud is eroded from the top and the bottom, and so it's precariously perched. And again, he seems to, you know, be quite frustrated that that nobody wants to, you know, help preserve it, and he's having a lot of trouble with that. And then there's people like Zahi, who's never been to the site. Now he's not in 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 office anymore, but he unequivocally says there's nothing there. As he does say, there's nothing under the Giza Plateau, which I spent five years in and out of the holes there, and, uh, you know, there's something, but most of those passages are blocked. It strikes me that the, nobody's been in here, specifically on the red level, like Herodotus in 450 BC talked about the blue level, but he didn't, he, he said he heard about the, the, the lower level, but he didn't get in. And so there's lots of stories about this place. I mean, this is no secret. Like, this site is known. It was just never sure where it was. Well, the they don't know what's underneath. We yeah. haven't had the technology to go. And like, and some people think, well, just go in there with bulldozers. And then you get 100 guys with their little leather baskets that they pass on. And that'll take 25 years. Mm. 
you know, that's not how to do it because you can't put, I don't think, and it's the, the guy from the National Research Institute agrees, you can't put um, bulldozers on that sensitive sand. It's just too, they're too heavy, too awkward. So those, that also creates a few problems. Um, I know that they have a lot of sand removal equipment. I think that's the way to go, vacuum it. But again, you need permits, you know, and archaeology is a destructive science. So you can't go get it without wrecking it. But that's true for all archaeology, which is why the archaeological record is so precise, because the idea is in 100 years, if somebody gets a better idea of how to interpret it, you've got, if you're in charge and responsible, you've got to be able to map the whole thing out you know, so that um, it's accurate and somebody else can pick up where you left off without guessing what it used to look like before you started. Right. Would uh, you, um, yeah, would you be, ahead. sorry, David, uh, would you be inclined to go into a little bit more detail, maybe pull up an image or two of the actual complex itself? And we can okay. just... Uh, so, so it is 107 acres. Wow. Just the area shown here to the edge of where there's stuff. So that's, you know, that's huge. It's 500 meters by 869 meters. It's huge. Which turns out to be 81 football fields. Like, think about that. Oh, no, the scale's monumental, especially being that it's situated underground. I mean, so five of the chambers are bigger than Olympic-sized swimming pools. So, so I've just been thinking in the last little while, it's like taking an airport and putting it underground. Yeah. Well, Why? Why would a chamber have to be as big as a pool and be that deep? It's just, and there's those, those, both layers, levels, have rooms that big. And so all but one chamber is bigger than the average size house. And that one chamber is still bigger than an apartment. I mean, we're talking pretty wild stuff here. So on the blue level, here's the size of the Olympic size swimming pools, the pink peach and then the pink is the average size house so look at all these and the average size apartment is the turquoise in front look at there's 31 chambers on the blue level but they're in a decreasing order so it looks random but none of the chambers are the same size and when you see that the red level follows that and here's the one chamber that's slightly smaller than the olympic pool um but these are bigger than the house but they follow a kind of descending, you know, path. And so it looks random when you first look at it. Yeah. But I measured all the rooms off the scan. And, um, and then you can see, you know, there's each chamber. And so the biggest one on the blue level is 19,580 19, square feet. I mean, what? <laughs> like, it's really hard to wrap your mind around it, which is why I'm trying to, you know, put it into metaphors. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, what's this, the size of a grocery store? I mean, 21,409 square feet. And so the exterior area is 81 football fields, 107 acres. But the interior is nine acres inside. Like, you know, it raises more questions than it answers. That's right. But I, I also think that um, a really good question is better than a poor answer. <laughs> You know, like it's uncomfortable not to know, but I think we all have the propensity. Well, what, we're, what we see on the news, on television shows, and in school is it is. This is what it is. We know. And it was this day. And this guy built it and all that stuff. And, you, you know, you, it, really? Maybe. Yeah. So this is raising a tremendous number of questions. And then these purple lines, which are the single passageways, um, are um, uh, 1.4 kilometers. 1.488 kilometers of passageways. So what's that about? It's incredible. It is incredible. It's a pre-Diluvian Costco with a <laughs> bunch of <laughs> it's, cool Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, exactly. It's like what we have in Toronto here, Dave, with the path downtown, the underground shopping center. Yeah. It just snakes all over Toronto. So this is the other construction, which is on the same level as the blue, but it's smaller rooms. So we have the same metaphor here of the Olympic pools and the house and the apartment. But those, those passageways on the other side are quite a bit smaller, which speaks to the idea of a different purpose. Mm. And, yeah, who knows? Well, it definitely seems that the, the red and the blue um, levels, like you said, there's, there's the two or three big chambers. And then the rest of them follow that nice sloping, decreasing arc 
down to the smallest chamber. So it almost seems, you know, harmonics might be involved, something of that nature. Yeah, harmonics. Is well, and that the first, that's the first thing I thought when I plotted all this, was that it almost looks like a scale. And there's 32 on one level and 31 chambers on the other. So like major, minor, or I don't know. I mean, yeah. we really don't know. And, and we also don't know if it's, it's like blank walls in there or if it's um, decorated. We don't know. And that, that's the fun thing when you were talking about about questioning. It's it's at this these early stages that the hypothesis get thrown out there. Yep. We start looking at it from all different angles, and uh, and it's asking those questions now, and then applying that to a proper hypothesis. Once you know you get in there and start digging, and uh, you know hopefully you get granted access to these sites and, and get to explore it further. Well, and I'm not. I mean, far be it. You know. I've always had one foot on the shore with this in that, you know, just because it's a, a phenomenal thing that we think should be excavated doesn't, and, and we would likely have to pay for it, but uh, doesn't mean they're going to let us. Like, I don't want to be delusional about that. Right. But the thing, too, is that by coming out with it, I mean, there's, as soon as people found out that this was happening, they wanted to take the information and the scans and call them theirs. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That also isn't right. So in this dog-eat-dog -dog society and in this milieu that we're in now of pirating everybody's stuff and Permaco going on YouTube 15 minutes after it came out on DVD, you know, like, like everybody's just taking each other's stuff and saying it's theirs or, you know, using each other's pictures and, you know, making it look like, you know, not giving copyright. And so I have a real issue with that. And working in the you know graduate division of educational research at the University of Calgary for years, and sitting on the committee, PhD committees, candidacy exams, uh, admissions committee, you know, all this stuff is like if you're going to publish, it has to be done properly. And because people can self-publish, there's this real propensity to say it's true because I said so. Yeah. And that is something I think we really need to be vigilant about and give credit where credit is due. And so it's just amazing to me how, how people don't care about this aspect. And it weakens everything. You know, like, like I did notice at Modern Knowledge when I was there in Vancouver that people were very, very much. And, and, and in issues like UFOs, mm. I mean, how do you prove anything? Well, it's not, it's like, but everybody was tracing how they knew. So I don't think the audience should ever be, be left with, how do you know according to what, you know, or what do you mean? Like, I think it's incumbent upon the speaker to help the audience understand and to trace what they're saying so the audience goes, oh, I can trace, I can go look at that up myself. That's right. You should be able to like, do so That's the platform I'm standing on. And, you know, this is, this is me sharing it first because someone else is coming along to say, no, 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 we found that. So it's unfortunate that, that life works like that. Totally. Well, and ultimately, it should be about what we're talking about here. This is our history as a species on this planet. You know, we shouldn't continue the line of, of uh, really fighting over it. We should actually be teaming up and trying to get this done. But like you said, that's not how a lot of people see it. They see this as opportunistic. They see it as a way of boosting their career. There's probably people that uh, even in the mainstream archaeology, eventually, who might not even want to touch this just because it might threaten everything that they've built their foundation on previous in their work. And this has been something throughout archaeology that's been an issue for, for a long time. So we're in that age where all of these new discoveries are starting to pop up. We're getting new technology to go back and look at things again and have a new analysis of it. And there's all this competing going on, but it's kind of putting everything on its head. Do you feel like it's kind of a chaotic time in the world of you know ancient human origins right now? Well, it is, and there's been a real habit that if something doesn't fit within the 6,000-year time mark, that they bury it again, and Michael Cremo is one to have noticed yeah. that, and, uh, and Klaus Donna as well. Like, they found some really ancient things in Peru, and he took it to a thermoluminescent dating lab, and they came back at 4,280 years or whatever because it's, they don't want it to be older than 5,000 years, and the lab's not allowed to say it is. So they kept this one artifact over a year, and then they didn't charge him. 
So what do you got? You got you got a lot of fudging around. So then you have to, you know, get the right lab and then you got to get the right, you know. And so but it's coming out anyway, yeah. you know. And this may be it. This may be the whole enchilada that, that that I've done the the calculations of the size of the rooms, had this animation made. Um and uh we may not get any further. That so doesn't do- mean that isn't still significant. Right, yeah. So where where does it just stand uh, on this actual day, uh, late May 2015, with you and your application to the antiquities, uh, 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 Egyptian Antiquities Department? I have a mentor from the National Research Institute that is coaching me in making this application uh, tenable. Uh, you know, to have the right level of credentials of the people that are involved that have the characteristics now. It's, they've set me on the path of finding the archaeologists, and I've been interviewing some. And like I said, there's rules, lots and lots and lots of rules. But also for me, having studied archaeology at the graduate level, um, you know, you need people who can think on their feet, who have field experience, who have experience with huge amounts of sand, uh, who understand the cultural patterns that can say of all the patterns, because a lot of people just go into one field and they're not measuring it over long periods of time in a large area, right? So the the trade routes for frankincense and myrrh over 4,000 years in the Arabian Peninsula, the the dispersion of pottery technology over 3,000 years. And so someone like that can come in and say, we haven't seen anything like this, Hmm. right? With uh, unequivocally knowing that. And so I've been interviewing the uh, the archaeologists, and I'm about to present to the National Research Institute about who would be best suited. But we have to look for availability, and past experience, and credibility, and know-how. Right. So it's intense. So and even again, though, pardon. So even though the, uh, there was a re- regime change in Egypt with Zahi Hawass now on the outside, is there? Do you see any change in the approach when when confronting new ideas about Egypt and about its history with this new uh, with this new and current regime that's in place? Yeah, there's not going to be anybody like Zahi. But you know, you probably saw that thing that went viral, that video about a month ago. Did you? When no, I Zahi haven't. and Graham Hancock were debating. And that was tied to a trip that somehow Graham was doing, that they were including this site. And they had booked Mena House to do a debate. And it just turned into a shouting match and Zahi stormed out. <laughs> and so he still seems to have his finger in a few pies. And he has his, his kids, um, which are people that he trained that are in there. So, yes, I think it is different. I have met the new Zahi. Uh, it's, it, you know, I think that you know, people are professional and intelligent and interested and all of that, but it's still a government, you know? You're still going to have that red tape. And so, yeah, I mean, it's different there. Like when I was there recently, there's a different feel to Egypt. Um, Tahir Square, we stayed a, a block off and off it, and um, it's got this real feeling of pride. You know, the square is all cleaned up. They put a monument up there about the revolution. Uh, but since, I mean, the, the revolution was all about food prices going up, up, and up, and the value of the Egyptian pound going down, down, and down. And that's just continued to get worse. So utility bills are 800% what they used to be. But there's n- certainly nothing like we pay in Canada because they went from $2 to $16 for electricity a month. $2 a month? I'd like to pay that. Right. So, so the people are still suffering, and the regime change gave them optimism that they could stand up for themselves. But the truth of the matter is, is they're still getting crushed financially. Yeah. And the other thing is, the price of gas was ten cents a liter for years and years and years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, it corrected to market value. And I couldn't figure out why the traffic was moving so well. And they built a tremendous number of new roads, and they're putting in a magnetic levitation train that the Chinese are building and all that but the traffic's flowing better because people are leaving their cars parked at home because they can't afford the gasoline for the gas yeah so you know like it's better i think it's better but it's still a government i mean and it's still, it's still patriarchy yeah it, it is and and it, you're on you're you're in egypt quite often and what what does the everyday 
common Egyptian citizen think of this type of information, think about their history? Uh, do you know what they're taught in their schools there? Do they, do they have any, like you mentioned the word pride, do they have any pride in their history and exploring their history? Or they just let the government take care of that for them and, and pretty much tune it out themselves? Well, even in the villages right beside in front of the pyramids, you know, like they don't care. They don't notice. It's not Muslim. If the, if the pyramids on the Giza Plateau hadn't been built the way they were, they'd be gone because yeah. it was used as an open quarry, <laughs> and so they don't care and it's they're considered un islamic but they they can't they can't take the pyramids down even with dynamite so that's the only reason why they're still standing there so occasionally you meet somebody who wants to study egyptology but egyptology in egypt is is memorizing scripts and mostly that's ramses and fighting and he warred with this and that and cut off the hands of his enemy you know and that's what they say yeah. and and you know even chris dunn saying all these statues were ramses a lot of them were amenhotep the third who's ignaton's father and uh you know so they just come up with the coin story and repeat it yeah. but mostly they're, they're being taught it's either coptic christians or the 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 muslim you know thing so I don't think they. I don't think they care very much. Yeah, because it's funny because I've been in Egypt on, uh, once. I was lucky enough to get there back in 2003, and it was right around the time the Gulf War was happening, and literally there were seven other people on our tour. It was empty. Uh, all of the all of the uh, ancient sites were empty. It was uh, one of the lowest points in tourism in Egypt in their history. Um, our tour guide was ex-military. And he did the whole, you know, the whole uh, the standard procedure of this is this and this is that. And this is, you know, the textbook procedure with us. But then you would get to talk to him on the side and he would get into this whole hidden history. And it's almost like he knew about it all. Um, and he was willing to actually uh, uh, teach us about that history. But he, he, he even told me one day he's caught between what does he think we want to know? And what do I really want to know? Hmm. So he he was telling me about Ramses and about Tutankhamun and all that stuff, but I he was waiting for me to prompt him on more questions just to see where my interest level was at. And he was more than willing to shed information on on a, a lot of the secret information that that you and a lot of other researchers have come forward with. So it, it almost seems like him being ex-military was almost in on this whole secret. And now that he wasn't in the military and just working for himself as a tour guide, had no problem whatsoever sharing this information with me. Just wanted to know if that's a common experience there that you might have had. Well, they're not supposed to, though, share it. And they're, they're <laughs> bound by their degree in Egyptology. Hmm. And uh, it's very, very strict. So when I, I led numbers of groups there, and I would always you have to have the tour guide, the Egyptian tour guide, and I would pay them to be silent. <laughs> because the minute they started talking about all that warring stuff, it just turned <laughs> my stomach, and and so it isn't that common that they know. But things like the the helicopter and the plane at Abydos, they they tell everybody not to show it, not to point it out. So when I go in there with my group and get everybody behind and point to where it is, they go, "How do you know that's there?" Right. <laughs> so so really, we still live in an age where we're told what to think. And, it, and, and the Egyptian temples speak for themselves, like if you go and stand, it, because they're accurately replicating the cavities of the human body, and the pyramids are replicating the whole DNA, and then the planet and the solar system and the galaxy is all kind of a mirror in the quantum physics sense. Um, you know, you can have an experience regardless of what anybody's saying. Right, yeah. But if they distract you and say, go look over there, then, then it, 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 it doesn't work the same way. And so, no, it's not common knowledge, and tourism has not recovered. It's at 5% of what it was over the years, and I've been going to Egypt since 1977, and steadily, you know, since uh, 94. And so, it, you know, it used to be where there'd be like 30 buses in the parking lot uh, at the plateau, and, you know, where we're the only plane on the tarmac last group I led going to Luxor and back from Aswan and no buses in the parking lot at Saqqara, which is one of the biggest sites. So it's it's not recovering because the mainstream media has done so much about, ooh, it's so scary, 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 scary. But it isn't, you know, and the thing is, is that to me, it's the same old Egypt. It's Egypt, okay. 
And when you land, they haven't been watching CNN. They don't know that we demonize all things Middle Eastern. Hmm. They don't listen to our media. And so they don't know we're talking really bad about them. And they're happy and extroverted and wear their hearts on their sleeve. And the minute I get there, I'm like, what a relief, because we're not in this machine, even if you don't watch the news, even if you don't participate in that ideology of them, um, it still is, it's still in the collective. And we live inside that. And to me, it's just such a relief to be outside of that headset. Yeah. And that just shows you how much pressure there can be, you know, inside a culture that's trying to get us not to like somebody. Oh, that's so true. Um, well, Carmen, do you want to speculate a little bit here about basically if we're putting together the research you've done for since you've been to Egypt for the first time, the books you've written, the Pyramid Code, and now looking at this site, um, I remember you mentioned earlier in one of your presentations, you were talking a little bit about some of maybe the ancient technology they might have been working with. There might have been a reason why they had some kind of an underground system like this. There's probably more as well. Uh, did you want to speculate at all on the connection of this site to your other work and the hypothesis that you have on, on the history there? Well, I like the two words, hypothesis and speculate. Thank you, because it's, it's, not, defin it's not definitive. We'll yeah. never know. But... Um, to me, it looks like a storage area, especially the blue level, where they had to put their stuff somewhere. And in my past life um, readings, early on, like all the way back in 73, um, I was told in a regression that I was on an evacuation committee when we knew that Atlantis was going down. And my understanding from the ancient records is Atlantis had three worldwide calamities. And it existed long enough to have golden ages and iron ages and go around the processional cycle a few times. Yeah. And so there are ancient texts that talk about the heart of the lion hitting the head of the crab. Uh, at that point, there would be some kind of a disaster. And that speaks to the constellation of Cancer hitting the constellation of Leo. And that's well documented. I've got, that's all over the place, actually. Well, not all over the place, but I've seen it several times, that, that prophecy. And it also speaks to the idea that the Earth um, was tilted 14 degrees off. And so all of a sudden, it went from being 360 days a year in the Egyptian calendar to 365. And that's what you see the angles of the Grand Causeways. Um, in Egypt, in front of the Second Pyramid, in front of the Great Pyramid, compensating for this 14-degree change that, you know, the, 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 here came the big flood. So somehow they knew about this. And so if we were in a full-fledged seafaring culture in Atlantis, and the, the prophecy was that, you know, in 50 years or whatever, this asteroid was going to come and smack into the Earth, if it was us, plus, you know, 10 other people, so what are we going to do? How are we going to preserve our stuff? What are we going to do for people? And so, you know, it's been suggested that everywhere there's straight-sided pyramids on the planet and they're finding more and more of them, that there was something about stabilizing the grid on the planet. Mm. And if the world flood happened, that's what happened in, in Bosnia, then it would deposit all this silt on top and then plants and, and trees can grow over the top. So, you know, there's, they're finding them in Serbia, they're finding them all over the place. And so um, maybe, you know, the decision was to populate the planet, colonize in various places with pyramids, and put the stuff and the technology underground yeah, so it yeah. wouldn't get flooded, something like that. However, because older is deeper, that could be what I'm speculating as the blue level. But what about the red level yeah. that looks like it's constructed differently again? And somebody knew about it because the passageways underneath are parallel to this 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 um, canal. And I think that the statement that the canal, you know, was leaking so we can't go down there, you know, has all been part and parcel of keeping this stuff down there and hidden. So if it's so much deeper, then the next level that doesn't look the same would be even older. Hmm. And so, again, because everything in patriarchy is squished into five, 6,000 years, we don't know how to think that through. And I think that's one of the realistic in, um, 
uh, positive effects of the pyramid code was that it gave a map of going further back. But we even are further back than that. And so for you, with all the, you know, ETs, I mean, one of my convictions with that too is that, you know, we imagine them in spaceships and that's been fed to us. I mean, there's the storylines that keep getting repeated, but we're all in our little cars, scooters, you know, whatever. And so we're all about vehicles. So we imagine that they would have that even though they can shape shift in and out. But if, if there was a civilization that star seeded us from a long, 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 long time ago, how would they have adjusted to the different atmospheric conditions, the densification of being here? You know, how would they have how would they have adjusted to being on the planet? Well, it could. I'm speculating that they needed these exceedingly large chambers as part of the the orientation hmm. to being on the planet. Now that is as far fetched as anything, and I don't even want to think that. <laughs> you know, but but. What could it be, and why so incredibly huge? Yeah, and it, it, that's it, what you're talking about there about the extreme human antiquity uh, yourself you, the, through the pyramid code, the work of uh, Dr. Robert Schock, um, redating the the Sphinx complex, the Giza plateau, pushing this back to you know uh, something happened on Earth about twelve thousand five hundred years ago. Um, this is the end of the last ice age. I've been recently uh, interested in the mechanisms of the uh, the decline of that last ice age, and there's a an event that people are calling uh, uh, researchers are talking about called the Younger Dryas event, where they think that an actual comet um, came in over North America, instantaneously vaporized the continental ice shelf, that huge mile-high ice uh, sheet that covered all the way down to the Canada-U.S. border. And I'm just wondering, a lot of your work, a lot of the work of other Egyptologists, the work um, and the research gone into the Dogon tribes of Africa, uh, it seems that astronomy and, and the, 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 the recording and the, and the calculations and the, and the documenting of the motions of the stars goes well back in our antiquity. And what's to say that uh, on your hypothesis here about these being storage areas, what's to say that if these things are, are, are actual, like you said, storage areas for an event that they knew was going to happen because of those astronomical um, calculations and observations that they were making. So it's almost like a, a bomb shelter of sorts um, that they knew that something was going to happen around 12,500 years ago, whether or not they saw this comet come in that was the, 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 the catalyst for the um, decline of the Ice Age and the, the flood itself. So I'm just throwing that out there that maybe their advanced technology was advanced enough to um, to actually predict this event and to prepare for it. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, whether the Atlanteans themselves knew it was going to happen and made the necessary preparations, I'm sure there would be a lot of their citizenry that wasn't prepared for it, but maybe a select few that had the means, that had the, uh, the knowledge, did make preparations for that event. Well, and that's what I'm saying. At the elite, you know, evacuation committee, you know, everybody's not going to be on par with that. But then, and we're, we're piecing a lot together through what they're finding at the Bosnian pyramids. And so we talk about Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, all of that. And one of the most interesting finds uh, was this bone, that uh, a, bare, a young bare bone that was drilled with holes. And uh, they saw it as an instrument, um, but nobody could play it. And then somebody from the Bosnian Philharmonic Philharmonic Orchestra put it in his left hand and he was able to get four octaves out of it and I've got footage of him playing it. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of a left-handed culture being matriarchal, right brain dominant, but the idea too that, I mean, if it was us, if we had a disaster, our, we wouldn't be able to stay in our houses. We would have to go and, you know, make fires in caves. We're here on using technology right now, but from one minute to the next, that grid could go down, and right. then we're walking around and using, you know, animal skins, and it's not that we're stupid, we lost our stuff, the grid went down, and so what would they have started? You know, where is Sirius, where is Orion, and of course, they were all about that, because they didn't have cities that had lights that blocked out the stars, 
And if they were seafaring, and that's certain, and even the boats on the Giza Plateau are watermarked, they say it's for the, the king to go to the stars, but um, why has it got water? Hmm. And of course, everything's dried up, so they put the boats underground. But, you know, to navigate through the stars is, is an art, and to understand astronomy, astrology, all of that, even to speak in their prophecies using the constellation of Leo and, and Cancer, speaks to the idea that this was really important to them. Yeah, and and so I think we've misinterpreted even the Neanderthal thinking they were stupid hmm. and dragging women around by their hair with a club, you know. It's like, I, I don't think that was it. I think that the grid went down. Yeah. And, and the David, really smart people ended up uh, compromised. And da I think, David, maybe you'd want to comment on this. Uh, Carmen, we just got back from Ireland and we did a a full tour of Ireland of all the megalithic sites and it seems again David this theme of starting over yeah. uh, that, that's happening here in our hypothesis here with Egypt uh, we also experienced that in Ireland yeah I know it was truly amazing to go around I'm glad we hooked up with James Swagger there he took us all over he did pretty much a private tour for Chris and I we saw a ton of stone circles ruins got into a couple castles even but the stone circles and the monuments and the alignments and he was explaining it um, the fact that they were using quartz crystal the fact that they understood where these standing stones should go to mark these different uh, you know movements of planets and stars and how accurate they are uh, going even down to Newgrange and they did a little reenactment there of how the Sun hits on the solstice and the equinox and it's just when you when you get into some of these ancient places and I plan on doing more trust me I'm just getting warmed up but the more, <laughs> more you get into these places the more you start to see the level of of care and planning and intuitive understanding and artistic rendering that is embedded in these places and then just Chris I mean you 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 had that feeling too when we're standing in Newgrange and they turn the lights off oh you the energy in there it's just it's indescribable. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that just goes to say what, what Carmen was commenting on there. You know, if, if the, the megalithic builders of Ireland and the tomb, you know, quote unquote, tomb builders of Egypt, if they all came from a pre-Diluvian race and this is just their attempt at reconstruction of their civilization with what they had to work with after mm -hmm. this cataclysm, cataclysm happened. Or... Pardon me, these megalithic, megalithic sites could have been put there before with the weight of them. Hmm. And Graham Hancock brought us that idea of heaven's mirror and every 72 degrees, if you think about the slices of an orange, didn't matter what the latitude was, that there was something that was stabilizing the grid. But also, you know, to, to get realistic dating techniques, and carbon-14 falls down, um, but even with that, because at 30,000 years, it starts to be plus or minus 5,000 or more than that. I mean, it really becomes inaccurate. Um, but um, Dr. Sam found some organic material, and they're, they're talking 38,000 years ago. So there, now we have pyramid energy meeting megalithic stone structures in matriarchal times. Yeah, yeah. And like, Gobekli Tempe falls into that as well. Gobekli Tepe, and the other thing was that it, it and the Bosnian Pyramid Tunnels were decommissioned because they had foreshadowing of the flood. So they were preserving, it seems, it's, it seems obvious that they, if they decommissioned the thing, that they, they wanted to preserve it, you know, for future times. And Gobekli Tepe was not a residence. They're not finding pottery and cooking fires and any of that. This was up on a hill, 22 temples, animal symbolism for astrology, all of that, astronomy, whatever, but all of that is consistent. And so, you know, once we wipe our patriarchal lenses clean and start looking, um, the picture that we've been taught is just not quite right. And I think one of the biggest problems is that, you know, in between there, that they were stupid. But uh, Graham Hancock in his novel, um, really brought that point forward too that you know and then and the other thing is about spanning the past lives so the front of the book looks like now with the the distant you know neanderthal upside down and the back of the book is the other way around mm -hmm. and each chapter is going back and forth between the times and at the end you realize that it's the same person 
Oh, did I just give the plot away? Um, sorry. <laughs> but, but the point of the matter is that's us. And so the other methodology for them shutting any of this down was that, you know, you only live once. And, and, and so, I mean, I just can't buy that because I wouldn't be, see, I, I, I'm all about this place because I was looking for it for so long. Hmm. Like something inside me knew that there's something about it, but also I've been listening to a lot of people who channel and that's not scientific per se, but it is, you know, qualitative in terms of perceptions. And I've had several people, you know, talk to me about going through these passageways where the, it would light up as they went through and the doors were blocked and there were symbols on the doors and, and those sorts of things. And so um, we haven't talked about the symbols on, on the, uh, the copper engraving from 1670. Yeah, let's get into that because that's really. I'm just looking at the looking for the picture now, and we don't but, know who did it, right? We just we. Just... Yes, but I can't say his name. Oh, okay. Lus Plexius or something like that. Okay. He's got the weirdest name going, so I just remember Does that. Does he have a copyright on that? That's on what that? I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> Copper plate engraving. Here we go. Um, and if you really need to know his name, I can uh, and text it to you. But I just go, I just I just blurt it out. So in the center of this is a square. And inside it, it's all at once. Like the, and a friend of mine who's highly psychic looked at this and, and, and she said, it's all at once, a pyramid, a brain, and a labyrinth. Okay, and so if this indeed is a labyrinth that we're talking about at this location, apparently the labyrinth on Crete was visited, the, this labyrinth was visited by the, the, the de designer of the other labyrinth. And, um, and there's a lot of mysteries that go with that, but if you got on a raft at Alexandria, you'd hit Crete, right? You wouldn't even have to navigate your way. It's just it's just over there in the Mediterranean with nothing in between. And so there's something about the you know the metaphor of that and what does it mean and the you know the hemispheres of the brain and the pyramid somehow replicating uh, the human experience, the, the 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 physicality of DNA. That there's something, and and that it just keeps going from human to solar to, to Earth to solar system to galaxy, and that these principles are replicated. And so I think we accept that the ancients had high knowledge, but if you look at the sophistication and the variety of these these squares, and then the archetypal energies that go along the outside. I mean, there's all kinds of different beings here. And then there's something that looks like biology in the feminine sense and biology in the masculine sense. And so to me, this is code. And I feel really comfortable with it. When I see it, I, I feel like my, my being settles down. And it's like, yeah, I know what this is. I mean, I don't know what I know, yeah. but it, it, feels, it feels like it's connecting on a very deep level. Yeah, now, apparently... Whoever that whoever made this was copying something that they saw down there. 1670 is a long time ago. It almost it strikes me as a mandala, um, and a mandala is a, a Hindu or Buddhism uh, yeah. symbol, ritual symbol representing the universe. Can this be like an ancient mandala of some sort. Absolutely, but I think that it's it's categories of, of different um, symbology. I think it's code. It's some kind of code. That's why they're all and sectioned so, off here. Yes, and my friend who had the, the, the experience of flying through the chambers and them lighting up, she suggested taking each of these blocks and turning it into a 3D and then looking at it. She even said 5D. And so she wants to take the whole thing and look at it. We haven't done that yet. But I think each square you know, is its yep. own interesting bit. Well, that's that actually comes from the movie Contact. If you ever watch that movie, they get uh, a message from ET, and they're trying to decipher it with their right brain, and they're looking at it in two dimensions. And what it did was, it took someone to take that two-dimensional image and fold it into three dimensions, and then the key was found. The actual primer was found to decipher the whole entire message by just folding that paper in and on itself. Well, let's do it, Carmen. You're going to decipher the code that is going to bring us back to our roots here <laughs> our well, next lesson will be origami is, yeah and i've been waiting you know for somebody to do it for me and then i'm thinking okay why don't i just cut it up myself and figure out how to use yet another program and just do it but still i mean i think it's profound super sophisticated and then very simple at the same time but so are pyramids hmm. super sophisticated and very simple all at the same time but they're meaningful in that they're replicating something inside us you know and so 
let, you know, the ancients weren't stupid. I mean, I don't know how handy it is to think they were, but, um, and, and the other thing I keep thinking back to the idea that we're sitting around the, you know, the committee, the evacuation committee, like if, if we were way back and, you know, we knew that everything was going to go to the situation we're in right now where ignorance reigns, stealing is, you know, acceptable and the truth is optional and all of that. And we were to leave something for ourselves to be triggered. What would we leave? Like if it was up to the three of us, you right. know, and I suppose other people on the committee, like, and we had this high knowledge and it was known that we were going to go into this bloodbath, blood from death, darkness, you know, enslavement of all humanity and financial messes and all that, what would we leave? Right? I think that's a really profound question. I I love I love what, how you, you phrase that. It's almost like, um, it, it, well, I would leave art. That's what I would leave because a picture has a thousand words. You can cram so much information. And it's also, like you said, art is a reflection of your soul almost. So is the pyramid. So is those structures. Everything in Egypt like you said before, in the work of Schwal Deluwich and, and John Anthony West, they're showing that these physical monuments and these structures are three-dimensional imagery of a higher dimensional plane that's contained with inside of us. And so is this image here. And like I, like you, Carmen, I'm mem mesmerized when I'm looking at this image. And it's, a, it's almost like there's an inner knowing when you look at this image. So it does have a profound impact on one's psyche. Well, I mean, you can stare at it for a long time and see something something new. And the beings that are walking along the outside edge are varied. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of beings with different heads, but you see that all the time in Egypt anyway. Mm. But and, and the thing is, though, is that I don't think this doesn't look like anything that I've seen in Egypt before, though it does feel like something that's that's familiar. So there's, that's why I keep looking at the different levels and the different layers of time. But the other thing is the third party hypothesis. So if the Mayans and the East Indians and the Egyptians and all these different places, Sumerian, have this similar narrative of, of the past, but they weren't in a position to speak to one another, perhaps they all had the same ancestors that taught them about these other places and these other dimensions or who knows what. And so they all had similar ancestors, hmm. including the Atlanteans. And so we know that Egypt sprung into form, um, fully, fully fashioned and then deteriorated. And so that's why if the pyramid's falling apart, the mud brick pyramid, it's because it's newer, right? And, yeah. and, the, and the joke of this site that wasn't this was that it was probably 30 years old and it was falling apart. That's us, right? The age of plastic. And so, um, yeah, and these secrets fit together. And I think that you two are really bringing together a huge community of people across Canada and, you know, speakers from the States and other places, um, which to me is, is, is um, a meeting of the minds and, and not trying to convince people of anything. Right. Because people come to these sessions wanting to be fed, you know, more things that connect all these different places. And so, you know, this is where technology is really bringing us together. Right. And that's really our hope with Modern Knowledge and the upcoming tour in August, um, where we want to try to bring some different perspectives this time around. We've covered a lot of different subjects on our previous tours and events, but I think August is I'm, I'm so excited for August because of the fact that we've got pretty much a focus on human origins and human consciousness when you think about it. You know, we've got Nassim Harriman coming in to bring oh, stop, stop, stop. the Sorry. whole quantum physics element. We have Alex Gray and Alison Gray coming in to talk about the multidimensional levels of human consciousness and how art affects consciousness. Um, you've got someone like Marty Leeds getting into the old numerology, uh, symbolism, comparative religion, going back and digging up some just some beautiful pieces of information about how connected we are, the golden meme ratios, etc. And then your work and Michael Cremel's work. And uh, we've got just a great st a cast of people. And when you put it all together, I think that the picture that's going to be formed for people is literally going to be unprecedented and it'll give them something to go home with, to look up on their own. And I wondered if maybe you could leave a little 
teaser for people. I know you're going to be talking a little bit more about in depth on this, but w what exactly you're going to be throwing their way when uh, tour comes for Vancouver and Victoria this year? Uh, well, um, I'm in production of the next documentary um, series because so many people have been looking for more Pyramid Code things, and I'm connecting uh, a number of different places where there's new pyramids, and 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 they're being found. So, um, and I'm speaking. I'm I'm keynote on a a trip to Java and Indonesia, going to some of these uh, sacred sites, Borobudur and whatnot. So it's more connecting of these ancient sites, how the pyramids fit together. It's just the progress that we're making um, and to be able to show it in a, in a sophisticated, uh, high definition way. So more, 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 more. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love the way, and David, you, you, you brought it together really eloquently in your last statement. And it, it goes on my respect for Carmen and her work and Carmen, like your whole your whole theory, your whole the whole way you go about your work, um, and always mentioning the matriarchy and, and the patriarchy aspects of our existence. And in today's modern technology, the the age of plastic, as you put it, that for me, that's the, the scientific age doesn't really marry well with the intuitive knowing that we all have. And I just love your work because you're not you're not afraid to go out there outside the boundaries of science itself and bring in that intuitive aspect to your work. And I think that that actually goes a long way in breaking down that patriarchal paradigm that we currently exist in. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Well, and people think that matriarchy is the opposite of patriarchy where, you know, women are going to control men and drag them around by their hair. But that's just not the deal at all. Like, I think we're going to come to see the last 5,000 years as a patriarchal hiccup, which is a failed experiment of what happens if you lop off the balance, and lop off the sacred feminine, because we, we, need, we need the balance. And so... You know, I was I was interviewed the other day, and and somebody said, you know, well, don't we need a little bit of evil just for good measure? And I'm like, I'm about yeah. done with evil, if you don't mind. It doesn't yeah. mean we're not challenged, and we're not, you know, looking to become more conscious. But Didn't you know, done it, that. <laughs> we're, but we're in a crisis of values. Yeah. And I said that that was the last thing I said at the at the Modern Knowledge Tour last year. You know, and people just went, yeah. I mean, that's you know, like when when truth is an option, we're in trouble. Yeah, no, we should be living right from that core. And interesting about the whole masculine and feminine principle, when you look at it, you have obviously the positive and negative sides of both. And there's been imbalances in both areas. And you can see that even in pop culture. I mean, just looking at the way women are being uh, addressed and, and viewed and um, itemized and, uh, you know, almost brought forward as some kind of a, a sacrificial um you know, corpse. This is the symbolism coming out of Hollywood and, and pop music and whatnot. Uh, a very negative view of femininity as opposed to bringing the beauty from these ancient bodies of knowledge that will help re inspire the positive feminine act. And I think, and I was speaking actually to some uh, Michael about this, Michael Tessarian, and he believes that it's going to be the positive femininity, the positive feminine side that is going to literally save the planet. The, the, the masculine side can't do it alone we can't we, we're kind of got our hands tied in a way and we need that maternal positive female energy uh, that will actually be what is going to create that uh, more positive space for us in the future so it, it your work really does dovetail into that and especially when you're going to back to egypt and back to these ancient sites and looking at it with fresh eyes again. And now that we can do it with technology and hopefully get some more insight from these discoveries and from even this, this discovery, that it might indeed, whether we can dig it up or not, it might indeed start a new sphere of consciousness and a new sphere of awareness that we can use to navigate as we look at other sites and dig up our past more. And I think that we can get out of this historical amnesia and, and maybe that's going to be another big thing that will help uh, set us free in our present time. Well, consider this. In matriarchal culture, okay, the men sought out the women because they don't have the cycles. And so for men to be connected to cycles, they need to connect to the woman who's having the cycle. Hmm. And D, the highest form of DNA is menstrual blood. And so blood from life was the essence, and that's what made the harmony. But the women would, would start to flow together, and then they would go into these dream circles, 
in the hypogeum and various places underground and they would dream together. So the rooms were big enough to put their heads together literally and to lie and they would collect their menstrual blood and they would use it on the fields for fertilization and in rituals. So the virgin mother crone were the three aspects of that, white, red and black, and that's the triple goddess. Okay, so everything was working within that. Well, when the patriarchy took over, they were still wearing, you know, the high hat, the red, white, and black, and the dress. But then they started sacrificial lambs, blood from death, and sublimated that we don't just die and get reborn, because the Egyptians didn't even have a word for death. And so we sublimate this whole aspect of death being like being reborn into the arms of the great cosmic mother, mm. you know, which you're being born into your next phase of what you're doing. We've sublimated all of that, so now we just have this obsession with death. Blood, 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 dead, killing, dead, blood from death. Yeah. So anytime you see blood sacrifices, it's on the other side of the blood from life, which is completely different. It's I like, mean, it's, if a it's baby can even... be born inside it. Yeah. It's worse than just a misinterpretation of those older understandings of what those, uh, I guess, particular rituals or rites of passage were used for. It, it was a manipulation of it, in, in my view, in the same way that when you look at religion, you know, there's obviously those positive co qualities to these different religious texts and ideas and teachings, but they, they siphoned that out of those positive traditions from which they were originated. And then later it got bastardized and changed into this idea of, well, our religion is superior or our ritual has to be about physical death and blood and sacrifice as opposed to understanding, you know, a connectivity and a maternal earth mother or whatever. So there's been a distortion really either way. Historically, there's been a distortion. Some people call it the great schism. Some people think that it was because of the ancient cataclysms and there must have been a few, but because of these cataclysms that literally fractured our genetic memory, our consciousness in a way. And then the priests of old that, you know, just, they basically just took advantage. They took advantage of that and started, you know, keeping the direction going of control of, you know, more of a patri or negative patriarchy of uh, ruling and, and kings and queens and priests, etc. So we're in this process now. And I don't think maybe a lot of people understand what we're a part of in, in the modern day, but we are in the part, we are in the space of remembering all of this, not just the good, happy parts, but even the negative stuff too, so that we can deal with this trauma and that we can put these puzzle pieces together to really get a, a handle on the present. Because we're not gonna be able to survive another type of event like what our ancestors must have gone through, if, if that comes, if we haven't been able to put the pieces together from the past. Um, so I think that the work you're doing, Carmen, and so many other people of really trying to get in there, keep hypothesizing, keep theorizing, keep throwing everything we can at it, because it's what is necessary for us to make headway. So I personally, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation coming up in August. Well, thanks. And I'm really looking forward to doing it because the audience is so rich, if you will, even if we're not rich in our pocketbooks, we're rich mentally. That's right. um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. And I, I just want to put a little, you know, caveat on what we've done here today, because, you know, the whole idea is you're supposed to keep everything secret and you're not supposed to share. And then people can come and take your stuff and say it's theirs. And uh, I feel like I'm way out on a limb sharing this with you now because by August, we, you know, maybe it, it wouldn't have been as sensitive information. But this whole thing that we have to hide everything, we're not supposed to tell, we're not supposed to share. And, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't have a gag order on myself, as I said earlier. But, um, you know, the whole hush hush. You know, and are you going to get in trouble if you tell? And is it going to prevent you from being able to go do the dig because you tell? And there's a part of me that, that has really felt pushed this week to just come out with it. And, um, and I realize I do have a lot of support in this community and a lot of respect. And I, and I appreciate that a lot, you know, from the two of you and from quite a few other people. And so, but it's nerve, this whole thing is really nerve wracking. You know, because it's it, there's a lot of interference patterns. There's a lot of you know who's listening and you know, who's listening to our conversations. And you know you can't send these documents because somebody's gonna find out what we're doing. And it's just you know that burden of that. I mean now I've got the burden of truth, I suppose, because you know I don't know who's gonna you know have their you know toes stepped on. But this is my work, you know, together with Klaus. 
and the, the measurement of the rooms and the finding somebody who could do the 3D animation and that sort of thing, um, it's not theirs. It's mine, right? And so it's unfortunate that I have to stand on a rooftop and say so. But, um, you know, it's just, it's not fair out there sometimes. <laughs>